Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. I hope you had a good little break. Um, we are now here for the last session of the day. Uh, I just want to introduce my colleague, Aaron Rees, who's a doctoral researcher at the University of Leeds and student and emerging professional committee member of the ICOM UK board. He is joined by a panel of students and fortuitously, Aaron is an alumnus of Leicester and I'm an alumnus of UCL. So it's nice to be connected to the current cohort. That's enough from me. So Aaron, over to you. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction there, Edmund. Um, apologies for my background. I obviously chose a bad time to remove all the wallpaper in my study. Um, and it just looks very bunker-esque, but I, I assure you it's not. Um, but anyway, as Edmund said, uh, I'm the uh, Student and Emerging Professional Committee member of uh, ICOM UK. So uh, two years ago, um, so yeah, sorry, two years ago, uh, the committee noticed a jump in the number of student members and wanted to ensure that student voices were brought into the committee to reflect kind of makeup of the membership that had increased, increased so much. Um, and there are many things that we've been trying to do as part of this, and there's still so much that we want to do. Uh, but I am really excited that this year's conference has seen sessions dedicated to future voices in the sector, speaking on their own terms and about subject matters that are relevant to all of us. So today is no different, and I am very happy to be introducing today's Voices of the Future session, which is made up of students from Leicester University, as I said, where I'm from, where I went, and University College London. So um, due to current global restrictions, some of the speakers are based in different parts of China, uh, and some are also in the UK. So this session has been organised across multiple time zones, um, which is always great to see as part of a working internationally conference. Uh, this session uh, has a focus on the future of museum making in China, and we have some really great insights from Pei Yulu, who is a PhD student at the University of Leicester, Zhang Yang Qi, who is also a PhD student at the University of Leicester, uh, Ming Xu Sui, who is also studying for a PhD at the University of Leicester, great for PhDs there, uh, and finally, Jin Yu Zhang, who is currently undertaking their MA at UCL. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Pei Yi to start us off. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Edmund. It's really exciting to um, work with University alumni and also UCL friends. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Pei Yi, and welcome to our session. We're very excited here to share our uh, findings and experiences of the future of museum making in China. And just give me one sec. Cool. And I guess everyone can see our slides. So today I have another three museum stu uh, study students here with me and together we're going to share our views of how is the museum so far in China and where do we go from here. So before we start, I guess uh, you already know a little bit about us and I would like to introduce a little bit more about um, our interests of research. So I'm Pei Yi, and my research investigates curatorial practices in non-collecting art museums in China. And we have Zhang Nanqi here. She's also my PhD fellows, and her research focuses on the role that art academies played in the development of um, contemporary Chinese art in the 1980s. And we have Ming Shi Cui. Her research project explores the potential of digital platforms in displaying the multi-layered interpretations of the displaced object. And finally, we have Jing Yu Zhang joined us here um, very gladly, and she formally operated the Weibo account of the National Gallery. So her research interest lies in museum learning, digital marketing, and museum IP business. So in today's session, we are going to explore the future of museum making in China. So in the first half of the session, we will share some recent cases from three experts, institutional curatorial practices, object interpretation, and global incorporating. So this part might take up 30 to 40 minutes. 
And the second half, we will summarize and highlight key points of the presentation, and there will be Q&A sessions. So please feel free to drop any questions in chatting area or if you want to share your thoughts and experiences related to the subject with us, we would be more than happy to bring in more discussions um, regarding the future of the museums. So we hope by the end of the session, we would be able to understand the current trends of museum practices in China and the UK and how these trends and challenges may continue in 2021 and beyond. So let's get start. So um, in this first part, Janan and I will discuss curatorial practices in academic art museums and private art museums. We will put an emphasis on the museum's values and the cultural strategies. And before we look into the institutional curatorial practices, I think understanding the art museum boom phenomenon in China is the key to mapping these practices because um, ex external, external contests where the institution set also will bring in a lot of complicities to the practices. And I believe no museum is an island. So the term of museum boom or museum fever in China refers to a rapid museum growth, uh, growth nationwide in the past 10 and past 10 years. Although the time period of this phenomenon is taken differently by individuals, there is a general consent that this is part of the larger wave of a larger wave of the global muse museum growth since the 1990s. And in China, the tremendous growth peak emerged in the early 2010s, where the numbers of museums is, um, increased by 200 per year and still continues to grow. In 2017, there were 451 muse new museums opened in that year. As you can see in the slides, uh, I put three different new museums. They are all, all built after 2010, and uh, they were located in different parts of China. So uh, compares to U the US, and actually the US annually, there were only 20 to 40 new museums in the decades before the 2008 financial crisis. And on the 25th conference of ICON in Tokyo in 2019, the museum boom in China officially gets to studied by International Museum Society. And the Chinese government now sees culture as one of the pillar industries of the country. The museum sector therefore succeedingly benefit from the national policy and has been considered as an integral part of developing the creative industry, also as uh, known as Wenchuan industries in China. And as a PhD student, uh, even though I may not be able to participate, actually participate into the museum uh, work at the moment. However, I think it is very important to gain, to gain knowledge of the museum fever phenomenon and thinking about what lies behind the phenomenon and how different types of contemporary art museums entangled with economic, culture and the political powers in China. So uh, I would like to talk a little bit more specific um, about um, especially two types of art museums in China now. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jianan. I hope she can share some of her cases of art, art academy museums and private art museums. Yeah, um, thank you, Pei, for sharing the phenomenon of rapid development of museums in China. Um, apart from the growth of scale and number, museums are also rethinking their vision, mission, and values. Um, due to my educational background and personal interest, I pay close attention to the art school museums in China, which has its distinctive functions and values. Um, I noticed that ICOM has an international committee for university museums and collections, which was formed for higher education museums and collections of all disciplines, and it's been 20 years. But I feel like compared with university museums in Western countries, many museums of comprehensive university in China are relatively overlooked. However, museums of, China, uh, museums of art academies have played an important role in production, uh, exhibition, and education. Some of them have become nationwide top class art institutions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, such as Art Academy of uh, Art Museum of China Academy of Art and Art Museum of Central Academy of Fine Arts. 
And the influence of these two uh, academy museums is grounded in the solid academic foundation of the school, and they have audiences visiting on a regular basis. So uh, located in art academies, they present art history, school history, and teaching outcome demonstration, which leads to a series of exhibitions and as well as symposiums. For example, they have made a contribution on promoting emerging artists and students, and they also have organized a series of retrospective exhibitions for many artists who are key people in their school history. And the publications are very useful sources for researchers as well. On the other hand, uh, Academy Art Museums also aim to connect with the society and play as a window for cultural exchange with other institutions. Um, basically, the place that Academy located is usually surrounded by many art studios and other art institutions, so it has active atmosphere for art. Um, nationwide, the degree show has always been in the spotlight. Like uh, Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts, the academy where I did my first degree has around 200 to 300,000 visitors with different backgrounds during the degree show. And it has become an influential cultural scene in the city. Besides, uh, academy museums do research on both indigenous art and global art. They invite artists and scholars from home or abroad to show their works and share their thoughts. As the slide shows, some museums are branding themselves by holding major events, such as a biennial um, international art education conference or art museum forum. And the biennial of Central Academy of Fine Arts Museums has been funded since 2011. Um, on the basis of the academic research foundation of the school, the biennial attempts to explore the vanguard in cultural thinking, research, and exhibition modes. Um, the museum has also been trying uh, to build the connection with other museums and art schools over the world. Uh, for example, it worked collaboratively with Class Tate Network on a curatorial project in 2018. And by 2019, it held a joint exhibition with other four um, prestigious art schools from four countries involving Royal College of Art and Art Academy of Dusseldorf. It aims to become a platform to generate broader discussions internationally. Thank you, Janan. And I think indeed the vision, mission and values are really vital to art museums development. And I think art, uh, academic art museums, they are uh, that type of museums which has really uh, fine um, tradition and they have the roots. However, um, how, uh, what, what about the goals and identities of the, the, those private art museums in China? Could you share some of them with us? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, for the private art museums, I, I, I want to quote a term first. This from uh, Wang Huangsheng, the curator and museum director. Um, he claims that cultural strategy is a, a crucial part to clarify and enhance the goals and identities of art museums. Um, in China, at least one third of museums are funded by private sectors or individuals. Uh, but due to the regionalism of the country, the development of museum is uh, also connected with the regional art market and local culture. Basically, art museums in Beijing or Shanghai have more opportunities and better atmosphere. Um, however, it is of great importance for a museum to plan for its cultural development and maximize its values in accordance with the specific conditions and to be a cultural landmark of the region. Compared with um, Beijing or Shanghai, the other first tier city where I live, uh, Guangzhou, thinks that it has a, a, a bit different uh, art scene. There are some curatorial practices uh, of Guangzhou private art museum and gallery, which I think they have clear goals and identities. Um, I can share two cases and Pei could share some um, cases in Shanghai afterwards. So um, the first one is called Mirror Gardens. It's located in a remote agriculture land, a Grandville Garden. The architecture is designed and inspired by the surrounding villages and it seeks to merge with this environment. It's a special art institution which explores an alternative working mode specifically geared to the contemporary Chinese context and constantly inspired by the confrontation between the contemporary life and Asian Chinese philosophy. 
And what impressed me most is um, their planting and self-sufficiency. Um, ingredients for food are planted there. They serve snacks and drinks they made themselves during the opening ceremony of the exhibitions. Um, this image uh, in the middle is a brochure titled Kitchen Experiments. They show the function of the ingredients as well as um, how to make food in an artistic way. The next slide is Guangdong Times Museum. It is seen as a vital part of Greater Bay Area's cultural landscape. It's a private non-collecting art museum located in the community, but has a strong connection with international artists and institutions. Um, I served there, um, I served as a tour guide at Thompson Museum for a year and I really enjoyed visiting their exhibitions, which explore and promote contemporary art. Um, in order to become a bridge between local culture and global art, it pays much effort to reach out to the community and it hopes to build up the links with art and cultural educators across regions and cultures. Um, they organize various of public uh, programs like community art festival to engage more visitors and residents nearby and they got artist residency programs they got vintage market and museum sleepover and they also keep in touch with our schools and educators um uh, there's a podcast called rolling congee they host to share thoughts and lively discussions with the audiences um as the museum claims it explored a variety of art education approaches through exhibition research, knowledge sharing, cross-disciplinary discussions and teaching practices, as well as to promote cross-field discussions and cooperations within the network. So um, although the museum doesn't have any permanent collections, they have clear academic goals. And I know there are some well-known non-collecting art museums in Shanghai as well. So hey, would you like to share some cases in Shanghai um, with us? Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, I think for private non-collecting art museums in Shanghai, it is also very important to recognize their roles within the art world. And in Western curatorial studies, it is widely believed that collection is the foundation of an art museum, because once you lost, uh, once you lose a curator or a director and an art museum without collections will be extremely fragile. And it is also true that once looking into the museum boom in China, there were cases that showing a lack of management and collections. Some museum directors even call those museums as mosquito buildings because they are empty. So behind the museum boom, there were a lot of empty museums, which is kind of problematic. However, there was uh, also private museums and even state-run museums without collections that has been succeeded in avoiding becoming those mosquito buildings. And the rock bond art museums in Shanghai, also known as REM, is one of the cases I would like to share today. REM is a non-collecting art museum in Shanghai. It holds a project called the REM Highlight every year to experiment with curatorial practices and audience engagement. In 2019, the curator Fen Rongher, he turned the museum space into a temporary theater and carried out a, a series of live performance art to draw more people walk into the art museums to watch art creations at the scene. So it challenged the previous opinion of the artwork has to be the central object of the exhibition. And it also shifts the learning habit of the audience because the REM believes that um, when experiencing an exhibition for audience, thinking is the most important thing. So I believe the institutions like REM, also Times Museums and Mirrored Garden, um, they are developing themselves in the museum boom and succeeded in maintaining the quality of the exhibition as well as engaging with the white public could be seen as um, pioneer and the model of the art museums developing in China. And uh, curatorial pra practices is a very wide and a general um, subject, actually. So in order to narrow down this topic, um, I think it's also really interesting to look into the object interpretation. So I'm going to pass he this to Ming Shi here, and she will share her research with you guys.
Thank you, Pei Yi and Jianan, for sharing your findings and thoughts on the curatorial practices of art museums in China. To also contextualize in contemporary social environment, my research examines the narration of displaced objects that had been transported from their source community to museums or organizations in other countries. This type of displacement occurred in many other countries and cultural groups as well. And the owner of the objects from the global south had been dedicating to the repatriation of their cultural relics created by their ancestors. As the repatriation debate had already been mentioned by the inspiring talks on the first day of the conference, I will examine these objects from a different perspective. So what is the story behind the displacements and transportations in the first place? And is there any way that museum can tell this rather complicated story by utilizing digital technology? Under the pandemic, we see a growing trend in museums worldwide to display their collection and exhibitions on the web, such as virtual exhibition or live streaming that allow the audiences to explore the objects on display in museums across time and space. So the image you see here are three major projects of live streaming museum visiting experiences initiated by TikTok, Taobao, and People's Daily in collaboration with major local museums in China, including the National Museum of China, National Gallery, and other provincial museums like Shanxi History Museum. And this is the interface of a mobile application called the Panoramic Palace Museum. So the role that internet and technology play in allowing the representational images of the objects to transcend physical barriers is also crucial and had already been used as a method to bring the displacement of displaced object back virtually to where they originated. For example, in 2017, two research projects, Xiangtangshan projects and Tianlongshan project were initiated by the Center for the Art of East Asia in the Department of Art History at the University of Chicago in collaboration with Chinese organizations, including Institute of Archaeology in Chinese Academy of Social Sciences and Peking University, which draw on digital images collected through 3D scanning and digital photography to virtually restore fragments now collected in Western museums back to the complete sculpture sets in Hebei province in China. The projects also allow the organizations and individuals who took part in the project to track the movements of the Buddhist sculpture fragments removed from Tianlongshan and Xiangtangshan thus get a more thorough storyline of the fragment's experiences. Another example here is the International Dunhuang Project, which used digital platform to gather and share information and images of all manuscripts, paintings, textiles, and artifacts originated in Dunhuang and other archeological sites of the Eastern Silk Road. Of course, these objects are dispersed in museums worldwide and also galleries, libraries, educational institutions, etc. And the data shared on this platform is freely available on the internet and they can be used through educational and research programs. Similar cases can be found in other cultures as well. And instead of just focusing on the objects themselves, other cultural groups had already tried to use the hot debating social issues in contemporary contexts as an incentive for international collaborations and their digital practices regarding to the displaced objects. For example, after the killing of George Floyd on May the 26, 2020, the reinvigoration of Black Lives Matter movement worldwide highlighted the historical issues surrounding the ownership of African legacies. And the responding to this social issue, the Museum of Ethnology in, Ethnology in Hamburg announced a project, Digital Banning, an international collaboration with partners in countries like the UK, France, the US, and 
African countries like Nigeria, which aims to, quote, digitally unite globally dispersed works of art from the former kingdom of Benin and create a comprehensive and sustainable catalog of the artworks and their history, cultural significance and provenance. So comparing with practices in China, this type of project suggests that the discussion around the application of digital technology could extend beyond the repatriation or restoration by taking a step further and see how it can utilize its na nature of connectivity and capacity in facilitating dialogue to run unravel a more thorough of stories of the displaced objects that represent issues left over by history. So this shows a tendency in reconsidering and reinterpreting the meanings of the displaced objects from merely describing what it is to how it came to the museum and what can we learn from that specific part of history it represents. This story that tells why and how the displacement and the change in the interpretations of the objects occurred has a more meaningful implication that echoes contemporary social issues or our re-evaluation and reflections on historical issues. For example, how should the story of the objects be told in the host museum? And how can the source community and host museum share and exchange their interpretation of the objects in a more equal and thought-provoking way? Most of the similar cases in China is that the first step of applying digital technology to reunite the displaced objects with the local context in heritage sites and predicated on the digital practices applied in similar cases in other cultures, I believe there's a huge potentiality for China to move beyond the current phase and try to find the correlation between the social issues still prevailing in contemporary society and the story of the objects. So as the digital images of objects had been mentioned earlier, which is surely part of the museum assets, we will move on to the topic of the business of intellectual property licensing and museum-based muse business ec ecosystem. So Jingyu, would you like to share your findings um, from the works you've done in relation to museum IP business or creative products? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Michelle has given us amazing examples of uh, digital display, uh, displays of museum objects. So in the following session, I will focus on the business of intellectuality uh, licensing and the museum-based uh, business ecosystem. I will cite several representative museum IP licensing cases from the UK and in China. So I will also use data and um, case studies to prove the potential market of the IP business in China now. So let's begin with looking at a report called uh, Museum Creative Products Market Data Report. There are four numbers that I would like to share with you guys. We have 1.6 billion that uh, kind of uh, represents in 2019, there are 1.6 billion of online visitors to the online museum shops. And this number is actually 1.5 times to the same year, but the visitors who visit physically to the museums nationwide. And of all the online visitors, there are 100 million people they are born in 19th centuries and after uh, those three numbers the three times represent that from 2017 to 2019 the market size has been tripled okay. um, may i have the control of the slide please Or could you please switch to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So to classify the museum products, we could have two different products types, such as uh, according to the function, we could have clothes, jewelry, homeware, and so on. And we could also classify the products according to the business type. 
we could have museum designed products, cross branded products, or cooperation products. So the poster on the right shows us an example of Metropolitan Museum, how they create, kind of cooperated with a game company called the Game for Peace. Based on the collection, they have designed a set of skins and costumes that is uh, wear by the character in the games. And we could also see on this Ella adult magazine cover, we have a famous uh, Chinese actress wearing the costume. So this case has shows us museum IP business could evolve uh, kind of companies from different sectors and different areas. So the collections behind it is the eye of Horus. I think my control, okay, it's a bit delayed. Um, and we could also see on this slide, those pictures has shows us that within the game setting, they have duplicated some interior design of the Metropolitan Museum. And for Van Gogh's self-portrait, it has become a hint to the next mission in the game setting. So how could all of these kind of business cases uh, be achieved? I summarized the whole business process into a circle. We could start looking at um, physical services and collections. So um, after this part, we could have uh, collection development, which is yearly achieved by the designers. Those people transform the content into product design. And after the design is made, we find uh, factories to kind of product the actual products. And through different channels, we could sell the products. Then it kind of go back to the um, individuals. And then uh, the circles kind of continues by sometimes uh, individuals could go back to the uh, physical museums or uh, business um, companies could find the catalog for further cooperation. To give a better idea of how the market in China is working now, I have collected the British Museum, like three products of them, and calculated their monthly sales. We have file folder, carpet, and eyeshadow. And we could see that their monthly sales, the total amount, and the sales result are quite convincing. Here, I would like to deeper analyze each museum and how they are choosing different marketing strategy to develop their IP business in China. So for the British Museum, they have uh, kind of cooperate with KOLs like online celebrities through the platform of Little Red Book. They recommend their products and their top sales are the cartoon image products that is developed based on the uh, Anderson cat and the Anubis cat. So uh, we have um, different uh, ways of retail as well. We have online stores and physical shops. For the Victoria and Albert Museum, they choose kind of a different way. They put more focus on creative marketing. They have choose the Weibo account, which is a, a platform which is more popular among the young generation. And they also do online live streaming, like exhibition, exhibition tour on Kiwi, which is a live streaming platform. So for the retail, they have, um, a creative way to create the same uh, pop-up store. Like they could duplicate the interior design of VNA or design the whole setting based on VNA collection, but put on like shelves uh, to display their products and let consumers enjoy the whole experience of shopping.
the original uh, case I would like to introduce is the um, the National Palace Museum. It is a local museum in China. It has one of the biggest collections um, in China as well. So they have cooperated with uh, BTV, uh, like a TV platform. They have created TV shows, documentaries as well. They focus on their collections, the faculty behind, stories behind. They cooperate with celebrities, actors. They kind of use like uh, theater-based um, kind of um, strategies to kind of introduce the uh, viewer to the context and they have a lot of online stores. Their online sales annual results could reach 1.5 billion, and that record has been contained for several years. And by 2019, they had already opened six branches. So after sharing all those cases, I would like to bring up some um, keywords for us to kind of think of or reflect on. We could see that there are instant gains in the museum IP market, but sometimes we also need to pay attention to the sustainability of IP system. And products could be eye-catching, but sometimes we, uh, as consumers, might want something with deeper meaning or deeper uh, kind of context with it. Of course, IP business, it has real a good like uh, profit value, but as museums, sometimes we also need to take care of the learning gains of your consumers or your audience. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that when we are producing uh, products of museums or IP products, we should be careful with the accessibility like when you are pricing it, maybe you need to watch out the price. Is it the price accessible to the general public? So um, that's all for my part. I would like to uh, give the channel back to uh, Pei Yi and then we are uh, going on to the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Jinyu, and thank you, Mingxi and Jianan for sharing really amazing examples um, of the museums in China. And I think uh, as the theme of the conference working internationally, so when um, you look into the Chinese museums under the museum boom fever and under a international environment, and I'm sure there will be so many trends and patterns can be recognized. And in the same time, uh, I'm sure there were a lot of challenges and opportunities coming out. Yeah, um, I definitely agree that um, the museum boom phenomenon in China brings much positive energy to museum development. But at the same time, the rapid growth might lead to some challenges as well, because we don't have a, um, a kind of a long history to explore the function and values of museums. And, so regarding to the future of museums in China, uh, no matter it's public ones or private art museums, um, if they need to enhance their cultural influence, I think the most urgent thing to uh, do is to find its academic position and values, uh, like the question in the chat box, the definition of museum. And I think um, the academic position is really important, like the, all the cases that we share um, as independent cultural institutions, um, they're able to take a stand, select the artwork and curate exhibitions, which follows their strategic plan. Um, especially when museums in China are collaborating with international institutions and have tour exhibitions, they could consider more about how to share, uh, show their own thoughts or indigenize the contemporary art rather than simply being in a place for display. Yeah, that's my thought. I would also add a bit about the future or the trends, how I see the trend, the future of museum IP markets. I think in general, it has an optimistic one because uh, like for one reason, 
for the audience or visitors, museums and their collections are more accessible to them because of uh, maybe a uh, work class painting has been transformed into a mug that is at your home on your table. So it is more affordable or easy to get for uh, everyone. On the other hand, for museums, we could see that it can be a potentially um, benefits or uh, venues for supporting museum for future operation. Uh, in the past few years, we have seen challenges on venues or streams for funding of museums. And these kind of IP market to be an easy start with and to better support and enrich the funding streams. So from that two points, I think um, the IP market has a, maybe a beautiful future. Thank you. Yeah, I think when hearing you talk, I feel like the development of museum creative products industry and also IP licensing requires lots of like kind of international collaborations. And I think also like when it comes to the interpretation of the objects, especially for the displaced objects that now personally, I think the relationship between the source community and the host museum is now more of a collaborative relationship. Because although the displacements of many objects now collected in museums are kind of like the result of unethical conduct, the question is that how can we move on from here from for the history is already unchangeable. I believe this requires close partnership between the source community and the host museum to form a more sort of picture of the object's life story and its implication on international relationships. So usually this type of partnership could be like reciprocally beneficial for both the host museum and the source community because for the host museum they can gain more knowledge about the objects and on the other hand for the source community they can also denote their ownership of the objects by sharing the historical record they possess that could indicate the object's historical connection with the community so probably from some for some extent that could have some influence on the repatriation debates or or and etc. Yeah, indeed. And I think uh, we as international students, like Chinese study and living abroad, studying in museums, and it is also a very good position for us to see more dynamics and more gaps between different cultures and between different countries to think more about the issues we just been addressed today. And uh, I guess that's all for us now, the presentation and the discussion. And we would like to have more times to have the Q&A session to bring in more discussions. And could you take care of that, Aaron? Yes, of course. Yes, thank you so much for that. Thank it was you. really, really fascinating. Um, and it's really, really great to see how four different like study subject areas can all contribute to the like thinking about the future of museums in China, the museum making in China and how that could interact with the rest of the world as well. Um, so we've had a few questions coming in. Um, I'll try and go through as many. There's some in the Q&A and there's some in the chat. So I'll, I'll touch on the Q&A ones first. Um, and we have a question from Albert, um, who worked in uh, museums in Kuwait on uh, Islamic art uh, for uh, about 20 years and was quite interested in the connection between Arabic and Chinese calligraphy and whether or not, um, I'm not sure if this, this is something you'd be able to talk about or whether or not um, if there's any kind of connections that you know of in, in that way um, between Islamic culture, I suppose, and, and Chinese culture and whether or not there's anything you, you're aware of there. Yeah, I'm afraid none of us is the specialist in Arabic culture and um, slash Chinese culture. Um, but I do know about uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, those area, and they have really close connections with Xinjiang and Tibet. And I think oh, it's also under the museum boom, um, there were a few museum, new museums and uh, focusing on modern and contemporary art, Chinese art located in that area. And 
uh, I think one of my professor was um, like kind of invited to there and uh, I heard they were focusing on to enrich the diverse of the collections in the Chinese museums, especially in the Northwest area. Yeah, so uh, if Abbas is in, interested in this subject and I'm sure he can look into the museums in the West East, uh, no, Northwest, sorry, Northwest of China. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, is, does anyone else have anything to say on that or do we want to go on to another question? Um, the next one. Yep, yep, she's going to the next question. Okay, so the, um, there were two questions that kind of touched on the definition of museums. Um, so one question uh, from uh, I think Maja um, asked, uh, what do you think about um, museum, the importance of a definition of the museum? So ICOM is currently looking at the definition of a museum and do you think the definition of a museum is important to China um, or to museums in China anyway? And then there was another question that asked about whether or not the collections are the one of the defining elements or the unique selling points of the museum. So for non-collecting institutions, do you think that um, they are museums or whether or not the, there is a different way of defining them? So those are the, the two Kind of questions. I don't know how you want to go back. Yeah, um, I think so. Um, yeah, that's kind of my area because I actually these days um, I've been looking into the definition of museums in Chinese context. So in Chinese, the museum is called Bo Wu Guan, and that has the different orange of terminology uh, uh, compares to the English word museum. So I've tried to be dig into the historical account of this word and how the China, more contemporary China is um, seeing the, those institutions being called museums. And uh, so first of all, I haven't had any answers yet because <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's quite like complicated history and also has to be dated back to the, uh, the late Qing dynasty with, where the China has been colonized by so many different countries. And so it's like a hybrid things. However, uh, if we look back into the modern museums or modern art museums in China, it is also really difficult to say if there was a very clear definitions of what is the museum in China, um, because most of them, they have applied a um, kind of institutional rules um, or the formats, um, same as the museums in the UK and in America. However, I think in China now, um, the cultural uh, laws and the regulations in terms of um, building a museum, it's still not very um, fin finished. So it's still developing because it's such a new phenomenon. It just come out in the past 10 years and it, it is actually related to the national policy because of the current five year plan. Um, they consider uh, culture is like a pillar of the industry. So the government is being devoted a lot of energies and times into building up new cultural institutions. Uh, where they just call the museums and in, a, in a, on the other hand because of the urbanization there's so many like real estate um, companies and business uh, emerging and if you have a certain area of the land which is used for cultural purpose and you can actually maybe reduce the tax or something so I think um, in China it's it's not easy to say okay it's just like public museum private museum it's not just like that there's so many formats some museums they were funded by public people but maybe um, they were also receiving sponsorships from the local governments because the government they want to have some um, political results um yeah in the annual report so they will try to um give some sponsors and um for and also, I would like to mention about um, the 
collections and the museum between be, the relationship between them. Uh, I think it's not, sometimes it's not up to the museum uh, what kind of institution you want to be, because, um, for example, like the cases I just mentioned, the REM, it's a non-collecting art museums and it's called museums because it serves in a public role and it has its educational role. Uh, however, it is uh, funded, it is part of the real estate uh, project um, in the Shanghai Bond and the head of the project is the Rockefeller Group. And I think because they are belongs to the real estate project, so it's really hard, it's, it's impossible to value the artworks value because there's no such regulations in China now, like um, an institution within the real estate project and they can't value those artworks as the price as they have in the art market. They just value them as their what kind of material. For example, like um, we have a sculpture which is made from wood. Even it's made by some famous artist. It doesn't value as the art market price. It values as a constructive material price. So it's because due to the restrictions of the regulation uh, that it is it is difficult for contemporary institutions now to build up their own collections. So that's why I personally tend not to make definitions of museums in China, because I think it's different contexts and it has complexities and it has um, so many factors that might yeah, influence it. So I think the best way is just to see where where is the space we can navigate. Yeah. and. And that's the exciting thing about museum making in China, because there's still so many possibilities and it, it, you, you never know what kind of flowers it might have in this solid ground, right? So yeah, and I hope that answers um, the question. Yeah, I think it touched on lot, lots of different things. <laughs> um, I mean, we have five minutes before we have to fully finish. I don't know if Anyone else has any thoughts on your specific area, whether or not a definition helps that? I think it's worth exploring this because we touched on the museum definition today as well, and it seems like an important thing moving forward. Um, do, do any of uh, the rest of the speakers have any thoughts on whether or not there's a specific area within your work that a definition is helpful for or not? Well, uh, I could add a bit for the academic definition for museums uh, in China. So we have different, we could say generations of definition, like official definitions for museums in China. Like the, it used to be uh, only collections, um, conservation and storage place. Like it has defined it into a storage place as well. But then it moves on to the like covering the public, uh, covering like education. And now uh, officially learning has become the top one uh, aim like of um, how or why museum exists. So uh, we have different um, definitions of different scholars, but together they receive, uh, now we kind of generally accept it into a research area, collection area, public area, and learning area. So in general, we, we kind of agree on that. And to uh, better support how uh, the government see museums definition, they have kind of um, a test or uh, something like giving you a, a grade each year for all the museums. So they have a lot of criteria to kind of give uh, a museum a grade. Are you top class or are you second class? Something like that. Um, their criteria includes a really important one is that how your learning sessions or your workshops are doing. Like if you are engaging with your community and your audiences. Of course, they have the uh, criteria of holding exhibitions, but now the learning role is more uh, and more like obvious. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's really helpful to kind of think about the different different priorities that are emerging. Um, 
I think we're at uh, 4.28 now. So I don't know if we've got time to really go into another question. Um, so I think if you're happy, I'm just going to wrap it up and say thank you so much. Um, I um, hope that you'll be able to kind of look through the questions that are coming in the chat now as well and maybe chat about them afterwards. Um, but thank you so much for all of that work today. It's been brilliant to have you here and uh, hear your thoughts. Um, so I am going to pass back over to Edmund now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for that. I think I had a Wi-Fi um, uh, fallout, but I managed to hear the entire session. So thank you so much for that. That was quite incredible and a real whistle-stop tour of all these interesting sort of business angles on museums that we really should be considering when we do discuss the full um, sort of uh, spectrum of the future of museums. So we are now um, at the end of our day um, and the end of this conference. So all that remains is I'm going to make a few comments um, and observations, um, nothing uh, too profound, I'm sure, as many of you have you know, got the same takeaways as I have before I hand over to um, Tonya, Eric and Catherine to close the conference. So I do want to give, you know, obviously a massive thanks to everyone um, who is part um, of today, whether a contributor or all the people behind the scenes who helped pull this all together. As Aaron um, alluded to, it's been wonderful having international speakers, um, as we always aim to at these conferences, but particularly now drawing those connections. Looking back at what we heard today, um, I think starting with um, Skunda, uh, Skindo in conversation with um, Tonya, I think it was so interesting those points made about, you know, people are central to initiating the change we want to see. It's about building that trust and the need to build empathy for us to make change, for us to progress. And I think that's an important consideration right now that museums are as much as anything, thinking about change, thinking about empathy. Um, Anna Elizabeth Gonzalez, who joined us from Panama, you know, it was incredible to see all the doing that she's getting done at that museum. You know, it's always great, I think, at these conferences to have that balance between people that talk to the sort of strategy and the planning, but also to the doing. And I think many of you were inspired by the schools program where they give school children the opportunity to be a guide for the day. I think that's definitely a wonderful way to engage that generation when you are doing these new learning protocols. And I will actually quote Anna because there was something she said that just stuck with me. And that was her mission statement for the Panama Canal Museum, which is, we seek to break down barriers and stay tuned with new dynamics and actively listen to people's voices in a much more inclusive way in order to generate connections, learning and closeness. And I think that really sums up what so many of us are hoping to achieve in the sector. After that, we heard from Fontaine Aravani, Dr. Aaron Bryant, Anna Burchard and Susie Hakimian. Um, and I think the takeaway there from that wonderfully curated Barker Langham section was, you know, collections still are a key part of a museum, you know, whether they are temporary, whether they're permanent, whether they're thousands of objects or tens of objects, collections are at the heart in many ways of what museums may be defined are. But I think there was that really pertinent point of how can objects ever portray human experience? And it's a rather powerful and somewhat painful reminder of the enormity of the narratives that we are living in now. 
So how will we look back at COVID, Black Lives Matter, Sarah Everard, the Pulse nightclub, to mention a few things over the past few years that museums are gonna have to decide, how do we want people to remember this? And we need people to realize that their actions right now are making history. And then finally, just now hearing from Pei Yu, Jianjin, Mingxi and Jian Yu, I think it was incredible to have a perspective that's really about the museum boom. Museums are popular. They always have been and always will be. And the museums are here now more so than ever. And particularly to the question at the end, it was interesting to hear your discussion about the definition of a museum and think that maybe this new generation of museum um, uh, definition actually has people and the public as alongside collections. So thank you to all of you. And just my closing comment then is, these are tempestuous times. And whilst we may not know exactly what a museum is, from today, we seem to know what it is for. It's for connections, it's for reflections, but first and foremost, it's for humanity. So considering the future of museums is an enormous task. So I'm gonna end with some words of comfort on managing change from the great art collector, political leader, absolute hero of mine and a museum maker, Catherine the Great, who once said, a great wind is blowing and that either gives you imagination or a headache. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm gonna hand over to Tonya Nelson now. Thank you, Edmund. Um, and thanks to all of you who've joined us um, through these three days of our conference. Um, I was really excited about the prospect of us doing an online conference and having the opportunity to be able to discuss content um, in great depth over a period of time, but also to be able to bring in so many voices from across the globe and at lots of different points in their careers and museums. And so I think the conference has been a real triumph and that would not have happened um, without, first of all, the speakers who presented and thank you so much to all the speakers, but also the team of people who helped put together this conference. Um, you know, this was really, really led by the ICOM UK committee. Um, and I just want to give a special thanks to Catherine McDermott, who is vice chair, um, Edmund, who chaired today, um, Claire, Pip, Aaron, who hosted the last session, Hannah, um, Nigel, and Christian. Yesterday, he was the, um, he was leading the discussion or uh, chairing yesterday, um, as well as um, Jilly, who uh, was working this morning on the museum definition work. Thank you, thank you, thank you to the ICOM committee. Um, we also were um, supported a great deal um, by Victoria, who was our conference coordinator, um, and Amy, who was our conference um, assistant. Um, and as always, the, the person who kind of is the glue um, with, our, with ICOM UK in terms of our conferences, but everything else, Donna Andrew, I wanna really thank her for all of her work in bringing this conference together. Now we didn't do it on our own, we had partners. Um, we had NMDC who, who always works with us to develop the, our conference and that's really great. Um, and then for the first time we're working with Barker Langham. Um, and I think the content that they produced was really amazing and really added a lot of rich flavor um, to the conference. Um, and then finally, we are financially supported by British Council and we've had a British Council speaker this morning. So um, thanks to them. Um, I just want to give Catherine and um, Eric from Barker Langham the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, Catherine, are you there? I'm here, Tanya. Can you see me? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank, all, thank you to all of the speakers. It's been absolutely incredible. Um, thank you to the British Council and Barker Langham, as you said, and all of the, the team behind the scenes. Um, but I wanted to thank ICON particularly for working with us again. Um, you're not sick of us yet. Uh, I think it's our eighth year on working internationally. Um, and it's just been a really valuable uh, partnership for us um, that supports our members in international working. This year, more than ever, curiously, because um, in, a, in a year of international working, which for the most part has been completely absent of the ability to travel, uh, it has been a time for um, reflection, but also a time to respond um, to often very overdue issues and debates that we um, should have been having for a long time, but we're starting to really tackle at the moment. Um, and as we heard yesterday in the live from Beirut, 
uh, even after a disaster like that, museums and people who work in them take comfort in the fact that they're not the only ones who are trying to rebuild. Uh, I think the beauty of this conference is, is that the issues discussed are the ones that we're all tackling. Um, we're all trying to embrace change um, and we're trying to, you know, create a sense of shared practice, share, sharing of ideas and a place to be inspired. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, it's been an incredible three days. Um, we've had some really amazing speakers and I think possibly more international than ever, which is maybe something that we could only achieve with it going online. Um, I think one of the key things that people have talked about over the three days is the importance of listening in all of these debates. Um, listen more, listen better, um, because this will help us to find solutions um, and new approaches. Uh, so uh, if I have, I have a seamless plea on from that, which is that we want to listen to you, uh, the audience, if we can, um, please tell us, you know, how you found the conference, what you thought, what was interesting, what you didn't like so much, what you want to see in the future. Um, we hope that next year we might be able to join some of you in person in 2022. So, yes, thank you, everybody. I'll hand over to you, Eric. Great. Thank you. And um, yeah, some thank yous from me to start with. First, a big thank you to ICOM for this opportunity uh, to do this. And a huge thank you to my team, because I've got to thank them for producing three amazing pieces that really has got lots of people thinking, very provocative pieces, but very, you know, really important pieces to sort of set, set the debate and set some real questions about sort of museums, where they are now, where they're going. I've been really inspired by those pieces, but also the, the kind of whole conference and in a way to show the kind of active role that museums are playing in the world today, um, how museums are addressing some of the key issues of our time from inequality to the climate crisis, but also how the sector and the museum sector is having a conversation that is both kind of introspective um, uh, some of the conversations that we were having on the first day of the conference where we're looking at ourselves and we're looking at our collections and our staff and how we are and our purposes and we're asking ourselves those quite difficult questions um, and I think that's really important it's very mature for a sector to have the confidence to look internally as well as looking kind of externally and trying to address kind of all, all of humanity's kind of issues and that's what that kind of bridge between those two, I think, has been really, really powerful. Um, I'm left with, you know, feeling of hope, um, especially about the kind of global community of, of museums. Um, we introduced this idea of kind of we are the storytellers of our planet and every museum is part of this. And there's a commonality there and a bond and a kind of unity and a union that I think it would be really nice that we continue to explore and the fact that kind of all of these museums can connect and do something on behalf of the planet is a really kind of powerful motif. Um, yeah, so really excited. I was really, I, the, the conference being virtual and the ability to create kind of films and kind of uh, introduce people from a multitude of perspectives, young people, glo global people, is, and has kind of really captured the time. I, 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 as I saw a lot of the presentations, I had a feeling of kind of urgency and a feeling of kind of real reality. And, and, and I think that was partly the platform and partly the kind of issues and the, and the topics that were addressed. So it was really great to be able to contribute to this. We would like to see this as the start of things that, you know, uh, our team can do working with ICOM, working with a whole host of partners. So uh, a big thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thank you, Catherine, for those final words. And with that, I'm, it's my pleasure to close the conference. Um, I hope you all have um, a really fantastic evening. And as Catherine said, please, um, we will be sending out surveys um, wanting your feedback on the conference. So, so please do do that and keep in touch. Uh, have a good evening. Farewell. <laughs>